This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Mark Nelson. Oomphal in the Sky by H. Beam Piper. Part 4 The Shunun had been watching the fighting in the view screens. Then somebody noticed that the spot of light on the navigational globe was approaching a coastline, and they all rushed forward for a look. Travis and Edith slept for a while. When they returned to relieve him, Alpha was rising to the east of Blue Lake, and the fighting in the city was still going on. The Shunun were still wakeful and interested. Quans could go without sleep for much longer periods than Terrans. The lack of any fixed cycle of daylight and darkness on their planet had left them unconditioned to any regular sleeping and waking rhythm. "'I just called in,' Travis said. "'Things aren't good at all. Most of the natives in the evacuee cantonments have gotten into the native city now, and they've gotten hold of a lot of firearms somehow. And they're getting nasty in the west, beyond where Gonzales is occupying, and in the northeast, and we only have about half enough troops to cope with everything.' The general wants to know how you're making out with the Shunun. I'll call him back before I get in the sack. He went up on the bridge and made the call. General Maith looked as sleepy as he felt. They both yawned as they greeted each other. There wasn't much he could tell the general, and it sounded like the glib reassurances one gets from a hospital about a friend's condition. We'll check in with you as soon as we get back and get our Shunun put away. We understand what's motivating these frenzies now, and about twenty-five to thirty hours we'll be able to start doing something about it." The general in the screen grimaced. "'That's a long time, Mr. Gilbert. Longer than we can afford to take, I'm afraid. You're not cruising at full speed now, are you?' "'Oh, no, General. We're just trying to keep Alpha level on the horizon.' He thought for a moment. "'We don't need to keep down to that.' It may make an even bigger impression if we speed up." He went back to the observation deck, picked up a PA phone, and called for attention. "'You have seen now that we can travel around the world, so fast that we keep up with the sky fire, and it is not seen to set. Now we will travel even faster. I will show you a new wonder. I will show you the sky fire rising in the west, and the always saying will seem to go backward in the sky. This will not be for real. It will only be seen so because we will be traveling faster. Watch now and see." He called the bridge for full speed, and then told them to look at the sky fire, and then see in the screens where it stood over Blue Lake. That was even better. Now they were racing the sky fire and catching up to it. After half an hour, he left them still excited and whooping gleefully over the steady gain. Five hours later, when he came back after a nap and a hasty breakfast, they were still whooping. Edith Shaw was excited, too. The Shunun were trying to estimate how soon they would be back to Blue Lake by comparing the position of the sky fire with its position in the screen. General Maith received them in his private office at Army HQ. Fox Travis mixed drinks for the four of them, while the general checked the microphones to make sure they had privacy. "'I blame myself for not having forced martial rule on them hundreds of hours ago,' he said. "'I have three brigades. The one General Gonzales had here originally, and the two I brought with me when I took over here. We have to keep at least half a brigade in the south, to keep the tribes there from starting any more forest fires.' I can't hold Blue Lake with anything less than half a brigade. Gonzales has his hands full in his area. He had a nasty business while you were off on that world cruise. Natives in one village caught the men stationed there off guard and wiped them out, and then started another frenzy. It spread to two other villages before it got stopped. And we need the third brigade in the northeast. 
There are three quarters of a million natives up there, inhabiting close to a million square miles. And if anything really breaks loose here, and what's been going on in the last few days is nothing even approaching what a real outbreak could be like, we'd have to pull in troops from everywhere. We must save the Terran-type crops and the carniculture plants. If we don't, we all starve." Miles nodded. There wasn't anything he could think of saying to that. "'How soon can you begin to show results with those Shunun, Mr. Gilbert?' the general asked. "'You said from twenty-five to thirty hours. Can you cut that any? In twenty-five hours all hell could be loose all over the continent.' Miles shook his head. "'So far I haven't accomplished anything positive,' he said. All I did with this trip around the world was convince them that I was telling the truth when I told them there was no dark race under the world, where Alpha and Beta go at night. He hastened, as the general began swearing, to add, I know that doesn't sound like much, but it was necessary. I have to convince them that there will be no last hot time, and then... The Shunun, on their drum-shaped cushions, stared at him in silence, aghast. All the happiness over the wonderful trip in the ship, when they had chased the sky-fire around the world and caught it over Blue Lake, and even their pleasure in the frozen delicacies they had just eaten, was gone. "'No lashed hot time?' "'Mayor Schielbear, this is not real. It cannot be. The gone ones. The always cool time, when there will be no more hunger or hard work or death. It cannot be real that this will never come." He rose, holding up his hands. His action stopped the clamor. "'Why should the gone ones want to return to this poor world that they have gladly left?' he asked. "'Have they not a better place in the middle of the sky-fire, where it is always cool? And why should you want them to come back to this world? Will not each one of you pass, sooner or later, to the middle of the sky-fire? Will you not there be given new bodies and join the gone ones? There is the always cool. There the crops grow without planting and without the work of women. There the game come into the villages to be killed in the gathering places without hunting. There you will talk with the other gone ones, your fathers and your fathers' fathers, as I talk to you. Why do you think this must come to the world of people? Can you not wait to join the gone ones in the sky-fire?" Then he sat down and folded his arms. They were looking at him in amazement. Evidently they all saw the logic, but none of them had ever thought of it before. Now they would have to run it over in their minds and accustom themselves to the new viewpoint. They began whooshing among themselves. At length old Chatresh, who had seen the hot time before, spoke. Mayors here, Bear, we trust you, he said. You have told us of wonders, and you have shown us that they are real. But do you know this for real? Do you tell me that you do not? he demanded in surprise. You have had fathers and fathers' fathers. They have gone to join the gone ones. Why should you not also? And why should the gone ones come back and destroy the world of people? Then your children will have no more children, and your children's children will never be. It is in the world of people that the people are born. It is in the world that they grow and gain wisdom to fit themselves to live in the place of the gone ones when they are all through with the bodies they use in the world. You should be happy that there will be no last hot time, and that the line of your begettings will go on and not be cut short. There were murmurs of agreement with this. Most of them were beginning to be relieved that there wouldn't be a last hot time, after all. Then one of the class asked, "'Do the Terrans also go to the place of the gone ones, or have they a place of their own?' He was silent for a long time, looking down at the floor. Then he raised his head. "'I had hoped that I would not have to speak of this,' he said. But since you have asked, it is right that I should tell you." He hesitated again until the Quanons in front of him had begun to fidget. Then he asked old Chatresh. 
speak of the beliefs of the people about how the world was made. The great spirit made the world. He held up his carven obscenity. He made the world out of himself. This is a make-like to show it. The great spirit made many worlds. The stars which you see in the dark time are all worlds, each with many smaller worlds around it. The great spirit made them all at one time, and made people on many of them. The great spirit made the world of people, and made the always same, and the sky fire. And inside the sky fire he made the place of the gone ones. And when he made the place of the gone ones, he put an oomphal mother inside it, to bring forth oomphal. This created a brief sensation. An oomphal mother was something they had never thought of before, but now they were wondering why they hadn't. Of course there'd be an oomphal mother. How else would there be oomphal? The world of Terrans is far away from the world of people, as we have always told you. When the Great Spirit made it, he gave it only an always same, and no sky-fire. Since there was no sky-fire, there was no place to put a place of the gone ones. So the Great Spirit made the Terrans so that they would not die, but live forever in their own bodies. The Oomphal Mother for the world of the Terrans the Great Spirit hid in a cave under a great mountain. The Terrans whom the Great Spirit made lived for a long time, and then, one day, a man and a woman found a crack in a rock, and went inside, and they found the cave of the Oomphal Mother, and the Oomphal Mother in it. So they called all the other Terrans, and they brought the Oomphal Mother out, and the Oomphal Mother began to bring forth Oomphal. The Oomphal Mother brought forth metal, and cloth, and glass, and plastic, knives, and axes, and guns, and clothing. He went on, cataloguing the products of human technology, the Shunun staring more and more wide-eyed at him. And Oomphal to make Oomphal, and Oomphal to teach wisdom, he finished. They became very wise and very rich. Then the great spirit saw what the Terrans had done, and became angry. For it was not meant for the Terrans to do this and the great spirit cursed the Terrans with a curse of death. It was not death as you know it, because the Terrans had sinned by laying hands on the Oomphal Mother. Not only their bodies must die, but their spirits also. A Terran has a short life in the body. After that, no life. This, then, is the Oomphal secret. The last skin of the Fushkut has been peeled away. Behold the bitter nut, upon which we Terrans have chewed, for more time than anybody can count. Happy people, when you die or are slain, you go to the place of the gone ones, to join your fathers and your fathers' fathers, and to await your children and your children's children. When we die or are slain, that is the end of us. But you have brought your Ufud into this world. Have you not brought the curse with it? Somebody asked, frightened. No. The people did not sin against the Great Spirit. They have not laid hands on an Oomphal Mother as we did. The Oomphal we bring you will do no harm. Do you think we would be so wicked as to bring the curse upon you? It will be good for you to learn about Oomphal here. In your place of the gone ones there is much Oomphal. Why did your people come to this world, Mayor Schielbear? Old Chatresh asked. Was it to try to hide from the curse? There is no hiding from the curse of the Great Spirit. But we Terrans are not a people who submit without strife to any fate. From the time of the curse of death on, we have been trying to make spirits for ourselves. But how can you do that? We do not know. The Oomphal will not teach us that, though it teaches everything else. We have only learned many ways in which it cannot be done. It cannot be done with Oomphal, or with anything that is in our own world. But the Oomphal Mother made us ships to go to other worlds, and we have gone to many of them, this one among them, seeking things from which we might try to make spirits. 
We are trying to make spirits for ourselves from the crystals that grow in the Kluba plants. We may fail with them, too. But I say this. I may die, and all the other Terrans now living may die, and be as though they had never been. But some day we will not fail. Some day our children, or our children's children, will make spirits for themselves and live forever, as you do. Why were we not told this before, Mayor Schielbeer? We were ashamed to have you know it. We are ashamed to be people without spirits. Can we help you and your people? Maybe our magic might help. It well might. It might be worth trying. But first, you must help yourselves. You and your people are sinning against the Great Spirit, as grievously as did the Terrans of old. Be warned in time, lest you answer it as grievously. What do you mean, Mayor Schiedelbeer? Old Chatresh was frightened. You are making magic to bring the sky fire to the world. Do you know what will happen? The world of people will pass whole into the place of the gone ones, and both will be destroyed. The world of people is a world of death. Everything that lives on it must die. The place of the gone worlds is a world of life. Everything in it lives forever. The two will strive against each other, and will destroy one another, and there will be nothing in the sky-fire or the world but fire. This is wisdom which our Umful teaches us. We know this secret, and with it we make weapons of great destruction. He looked over the seated Shunun, picking out those who wore the flame-colored cloaks of the fire-dance. "'You, and you, and you,' he said. "'You have been making this dreadful magic, and leading your people in it. And which among the rest of you have not been guilty?' "'We did not know,' one of them said. "'Mayor Schielbeer, have we yet time to keep this from happening? Yes, there is only a little time, but there is time. You have until the always same passes across the face of the sky fire. That would be seven hundred and fifty hours. If this happens, all is safe. If the sky fire blots out the always same, we are all lost together. You must go among your people and tell them what madness they are doing, and command them to stop. You must command them to lay down their arms and cease fighting, and you must tell them of the awful curse that was put upon the Terrans in the long-ago time for a lesser sin than they are now committing. If we say that Mayor Schielbeer told us this, the people may not believe us. He is not known to all and some would take no Terran's word, not even his. Would anybody tell a secret of this sort about his own people if it were not real? We had better say nothing about Mayor's Hildebert. We will say that the gone ones told us in dreams. Let us say that the Great Spirit sent a dream of warning to each of us, another Shunu said. There has been too much talk about dreams from the gone ones already. But the Great Spirit has never sent a dream. Nothing like this has ever happened before, either." He rose, and they were silent. "'Go to your living place now,' he told them. "'Talk of how best you may warn your people.' He pointed to the clock. "'You have an oomph like that in your living place. When the shorter spear has moved three places, I will speak with you again and then you will be sent in air-cars to your people to speak to them." He went up the escalator and down the hall to Miles's office on the third floor without talking. Fox's Travis was singing softly, almost inaudibly. "'You will eat in the sweet by and by. You will get oomphal in the sky when you die.' Inside, Edith Shaw slumped dispiritedly in a chair. Fox Travis went to the coffee-maker and started it. Miles snapped on the communication screen and punched the combination of General Maith's headquarters. 
As soon as the uniformed girl who appeared in it saw him, her hands moved quickly. The screen flickered, and the general appeared in it. "'We have it made, General. They're sold. We're ready to start them out in three hours.' May's thin, weary face suddenly lighted. "'You mean they're going to cooperate?' He shook his head. "'They think they're saving the world. They think we're cooperating with them.' The general laughed. "'That's even better. How do you want them sent out?' "'The ones in the Blue Lake area first. Better have some picked K&I in native costume, with pistols to go with them. They'll need protection till they're able to get a hearing for themselves. After they're all out, the ones from Gonzales' area can be started." He thought for a moment. "'I want four or five of them left here to help me when you start bringing more Shunun in from other areas. How soon do you think you'll have another class for me?' Two or three days, if everything goes all right.' "'We have the villages and plantations in the south under pretty tight control now. We can start gathering them up right away. As soon as things get stabilized here, we can send reinforcements to the north. We'll have transport for you in three hours." The general blanked out. He turned from the screen. Travis was laughing happily. "'Miles, did anybody ever tell you you were a genius?' he asked. "'That last jolt you gave them was perfect. Why didn't you tell us about it in advance?' "'I didn't know about it in advance. I didn't think of it till I started talking to them. No cream or sugar for me." "'Cream,' Edith said lifelessly. "'Why did you do it? Why didn't you just tell them the truth?' Travis asked her to define the term. She started to say something bitter about jesting Pilot. Miles interrupted. "'In spite of Lord Beacon, Pilot wasn't jesting,' he said and he didn't stay for an answer because he knew he'd die of old age waiting for one. What kind of truth should I have told them? Why, what you started to tell them, that Beta moves in a fixed orbit and can't get any closer to Alpha. There's been some work done on the question since Pilot's time, Travis said. My semantics prof at Command College had the start of an answer. He defined truth as a statement. A statement exists only in the mind of the person making it, and the mind of the person to whom it is made. If the person to whom it is made can't understand or accept it, it isn't the truth. They understood when you showed them that the planet was round, and they understood that tridimensional model of the system. Why didn't you let it go at that? They accepted it intellectually. But when I told them that there wasn't any chance of Quanon getting any closer to Alpha, they rebelled emotionally. It doesn't matter how conclusively you prove anything. If the person to whom you prove it can't accept your proof emotionally, it's still false, not real. They had all their emotional capital invested in this always cool time, Travis told her. They couldn't let Miles wipe that out for them. So he shifted it from this world to the next, and convinced them they were getting a better deal that way. You saw how quickly they picked it up, and he didn't have the sin of telling children there is no Easter Bunny on his conscience, either. But why did you tell them that story about the Oomphal Mother, she insisted? Now they'll go out and tell all the other natives, and they'll believe it. Would they have believed it if I told them about Terran scientific technology? Your people have been doing that for close to half a century. You see what impression it's made. But you told them. You told them that Terrans have no souls. Can you prove that was a lie? Travis asked. Let's see yours. Draw, soul, inspection, soul. Naturally, Fox Travis would expect a soul to be carried in a holster. But they'll look down on us now. They'll say we're just like animals. Edith almost wailed. Now it comes out, Travis said. We won't be the lordly Terrans any more, helping out the poor benighted Quans out of the goodness of our hearts, scattering largesse, bearing the Terrans' burden. New model, a giveaway instead of a gun. Now they'll pity us. They'll think we're inferior beings. 
I don't think the natives are inferior beings. She was almost in tears. If you don't, why did you come all the way to Quanon to try to make them more like Terrans? Knock it off, Fox. Stop heckling her. Travis looked faintly surprised. Maybe he hadn't realized before that a boss newsman learns to talk like a commanding officer. You remember what Ramon Gonzalez was saying, out at Sanders, about the inferior's hatred for the superior as superior? It's no wonder these Quans resent us. They have a right to. We've done them all an unforgivable injury. We've let them see us doing things they can't do. Of course they resent us. But now I've given them something to feel superior about. When they die, they'll go to the place of the gone ones and have oomphal in the sky, and they will live forever in new bodies. But when we die, we just die, period. So they'll pity us and politely try to hide their condescension toward us. And because they feel superior to us, they'll want to help us. They'll work hard on the plantations so that we can have plenty of biocrystals, and their shunun will work magic for us to help us poor benighted Terrans to grow souls for ourselves so that we can be almost like them. Of course, they'll have a chance to exploit us and get oomphal from us, too, but the important thing will be to help the poor Terrans. Maybe they'll even organize a spiritual and magical assistance agency. End of Oomphal in the Sky by H. Beam Piper This recording is in the public domain.